world is massive, but flying has made it feel a bit smaller by giving us the abil incredible ability to travel anywhere in the world within 24 hours. And because of that, the world has become more interconnected than it ever has been before. But have you ever not traveled somewhere because of how long or expensive the flight would be? Well, even though planes are pretty uh, incredible and fast, it can still take a full day of flying to travel long distances. And the longer a flight takes, the less likely you are able to take the time off to travel. And also, the longer it is, the more expensive the flight becomes because of the expenses you need to pay out to the staff that operates the flight. So what if you could travel anywhere at supersonic speeds that are nearly three times faster than the average plane? Well, that is what the bold mission of my guest today is. His name's Norris Tai, and he's working hard to make this possible. So Norris T is the co-founder and CEO of Vexasonic. And since childhood, he has been passionate about making the world smaller through faster transportation. In pursuit of his mission, Norris studied aerospace engineering at UCLA. He spent three years working in the aerospace industry as a propulsion engineer, and they were and he worked on vehicles that would break the sound barrier, similar to what Exosonic is doing. And after his time in industry, he determined that low boom supersonic travel was the future and attended Stanford's Graduate School of Business to found Exosonic with his co-founder and CTO, Tim McDonald. Now they're on a mission to provide supersonic travel everywhere. So how in the world is Norris approaching the bold mission of building an exosonic plane, a supersonic plane? And, you know, this is a mission that will require 10 plus years to fulfill. So we're going to dig deep on how he deals with the fact that it will take so long to achieve such a massive feat and what the strategy and thinking behind making it happen is. We also touch on Norris's approach to hiring exceptional engineering talent and how he has been able to find and convince engineers to join him on this crazy mission. So you're listening to the Inventing the Future podcast, where it is our mission to introduce you to the entrepreneurs and ideas that will inspire and empower you to solve the world's biggest problems. This is Julian Alvarez, and I'm a Gen Z entrepreneur and software engineer at Facebook. So with that, please enjoy this fascinating conversation with Norris. All right, welcome back everyone to another episode. I have a, an awesome guest with me today that's gonna help us travel at supersonic speeds. So Norris, uh, welcome to the show, man. Cool, Julian, thanks for having me on board. Absolutely, yeah, so uh, to start off, Norris, I, it would be great uh, to hear a bit about your story, how you got interested in the aviation industry, <laughs> and yeah, why you even decided to make this insane decision to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, I'll try to answer all those three questions <laughs> in, in a couple of minutes here. Uh, just for some context, so I'm Norris, CEO and co-founder of Exosonic, which I, I'm sure you talked about in the intro. And our mission is to take people supersonic everywhere. And we're doing that by developing a quiet supersonic airliner. Now, we are developing smaller supersonic products in the interim so that we can de-risk the technology to get to the supersonic airliner and build a path to revenue earlier on. Uh, so that we don't have to solely rely on the supersonic airliner that's going to be in service in the mid 2030s time frame to get there. Now, for my own personal journey, it really started out a long time ago, uh, since childhood, really. And it grew out of my frustrations of being unable to visit my grandparents in Asia. I mean, we've all been there on those international flights. It takes 12 hours and it just it just really stinks. And because of those long flight times, I could at best visit them once a year, but more realistically, once every few years. And that led to a lot of missed occasions, right? Whether that be holidays, life events like marriages, uh, and most importantly, a missed opportunity to have a close relationship with my grandparents. And so <clears throat> later on, as I grew up and I got exposed to aerospace from a pretty early age and kind of grew my own passion for that from school, hobbies, and things like that. And there came a moment in my life in which I, I kind of put these two things together. One, my frustration of long travel times, in addition to my, my passion for aerospace. 
and knowing that we're not going to fly subsonic speech forever. Uh, so I thought, why don't I do something? Why don't I make a difference and try to figure out a way in which to move people around the world faster? And so since high school, I've dedicated my career to figuring that problem out. And that's manifested in the form of exosonic. I love that. You know, what I find really interesting about this is that most people would have seen like a long flight as an inconvenience or most people or a lot of people would have been like, whoa, we can travel across the world in 12 hours. <laughs> That's amazing. But yeah. you saw it as a as a major pain point. Uh, so mm -hmm. why why did you look at it that way? And and why did you decide to do something about this when the easiest thing would have been to just go on with your nor normal life? <laughs> <laughs> because it's a pain point. I mean, like I'm sure you have this experience and others in your audience have had this experience of just wanting to go somewhere, you know, that's kind of far. I mean, I would certainly love to go to Australia, New Zealand, but it's just, it just takes such a long time to get there. Right. And even Hawaii, right. I mean, I think Hawaii is only six hours away from the coast of California, but like, you know, if you are living on the Island, it's kind of hard to go back to the mainland because of the long flight. You can't go there as much as you want. Uh, and so I think people just generally suffer from long flights. I mean, yes, it's obviously been better than, say, taking a, a cruise ship across the ocean, right? But what, are we going to just be satisfied with the status quo forever and suffer through 12 you know, plus hour of flights or even six hour flights? And I think the answer is no. Someone's got to do something that will make transportation even more convenient and that will open up the world even more. Yeah, I love that. I think when we um, are so accustomed to our normal life and, and how amazing it is in many ways, we're blinded yeah. to the opportunities that might uh, exist there. And I think when you get into the habit of questioning the status quo, mm -hmm. so many opportunities spring almost out of nowhere. So super interesting that that happened for you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And um, so I saw that you went, you went to college, did aerospace, and you even worked as a, an engineer for some time. So what was that moment where you decided to start a company and be like, all right, it's time. I got to do this. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was actually back in that moment in high school when I thought, why don't I do something about bringing forth faster transportation? Because at that time, you know, the Concorde recently retired and it didn't look like there was any aircraft that was being built to replace the Concorde. And so I thought, well, if no one's working on it, I should make a difference. Like, why don't I do something about it? Why don't I be the change maker that creates a company to bring this product uh, to life? And so I think since high school, I've always thought to myself, I want to build this company that does that. And you can even see in my, my undergraduate experience at UCLA, I focus both on engineering, but also spend some time doing my extracurriculars and entrepreneurship because I really wanted to learn more about how to build a business. And even when I was doing my engineering work at the various defense companies, I was part of a nonprofit called Spaceport LA, where I wanted to learn more about how to start businesses, network with other you know, aerospace entrepreneurs in Los Angeles and just really get tied into that ecosystem. And again, that's how I explored how to develop a company while doing engineering work. Wow. So that's crazy. This started in high school. You're a high schooler and you thought, whoa, why is no one doing this? I, I, I want to help build supersonic <clears throat> planes. But like, I mean, what makes what made you believe at that time that you could do this, given that at that time you, you didn't like have the engineering background and there's so <laughs> so many other people with like engineering degrees and yeah. have worked in aviation for so long. Like, why why do you have that thought to think so boldly in high school and believe you could do it? Yeah, because I think in, especially in high school, when you're a teenager, you know, you believe you can do anything and everyone is wrong and and you're also unencumbered by these artificial limitations put on to you through experience and by hearing all these other people. Right. And, and I think that's, that's, <laughs> it's a really good age to dream big. And I think it's also important to maintain that dream as you get older and learn more things, right? You learn more things, not to, you know, discredit the dreams that you had earlier, 
but just to learn more about the problem and the challenges that you'll have to face as you, you know, go tackle that. Um, if I may uh, add to this, you know, I don't think I was any special high school student. You know, I, I mean, you've heard those stories about high school students that like had computer games, built their own, you know, rockets or like, you know, just had their own kind of garage full of um, electronic devices or whatever. And, and were really, uh, how, how would you say this, like prodigies for developing these things. That, that certainly wasn't me. You know, what I was doing in high school was like, yeah, I took AP classes and things like that. You know, I did sports. Um, I also did a little bit of side stuff in rockets just to learn a little bit more about it, but nothing nothing out of the ordinary, I would say. Um, so I feel like <clears throat> you don't need to be anyone special or ex you know extremely gifted to, to dream big and chase that dream as you get older. Yeah. Yeah, you don't necessarily need to be extraordinary in your ability because almost everyone starts off uh, from that beginner's mindset. Uh, but you do need to be extraordinary in the way that you think because that's what closes the gap. Um, but I mean, like, you know, this is something so bold. Like, didn't people tell you, like, this can't be done or you're crazy? Like, how are you going to do this? Uh, weren't there people that tried to shut you down? And if so, how would you deal with that? Yeah. Um, I mean, that still happens every day, right? <laughs> I mean, you talk to people, they're skeptical of what you're doing, but you know, it's okay. Uh, I think what's helpful is you find the advocates that are there and, and you, you get energy from them in addition to having, you know, your own self-confidence and belief that you're going to do it. I think one thing is that it's, it's easy to point out uh, problems or be critical of something, but I think, you know, because you understand the problem more, you can understand, okay, yes, they're critical about that. And we're going to work on that. Maybe not at this point in time, but we want to address that. And you really turn that criticism into uh, just a, another thing that you have to work on later on. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah. And then it also inspires you to prove the haters wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. That is, that is certainly true. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, cool. So tell us, tell me a bit more about uh, Exosonic. What is, what is Exosonic, the company, and and the product you guys are are building? Yeah. So uh, as I briefly described in the beginning, we're developing a quiet supersonic airliner to enter service in the mid twenty thirties time frame. So we're targeting Mach one point eight, which is roughly two two and a half times faster than aircraft today. Uh, fly up to 5,000 nautical miles. So that's like saying you go from Los Angeles or San Francisco to London in six hours or so. And we'll carry up to 70 passengers. Now, we understand it'll be, you know, relatively expensive at the beginning. You know, we are targeting business class prices uh, initially, but hopefully as we develop more supersonic airplanes and the technology gets better, more affordable, then we can go down that cost curve. An analogy is think about, you know, the jet travel of the 1960s, where it's only for the super wealthy. And look, now there's Spirit Airlines where you can go anywhere for like, you know, $60, basically. Um, <clears throat> now, so that's the supersonic airliner aspect. And I did mention that we're developing smaller supersonic products along the way. Uh, we don't, at this point, we're not going to talk too much about that. Uh, we're going to keep that under wraps, but we hope to have some uh, pretty enticing or interesting news about that in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It, it's uh, also a similar approach to what Tesla did, right? Where they started mm -hmm. with the high-end Tesla Roadster and built their way down, uh, improving efficiencies, um, raising enough capital with that higher-end model in order to fund uh, the development and the manufacturing capacity that was needed to reach larger masses. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, is that is that kind of like one of the most common strategies that you would take for like a hardware product that's hard to build? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, <clears throat> the way that we look at it is it's really important uh, to have incremental steps along the way, especially for such a, an audacious dream, right? I think it's uh, perhaps foolhardy to believe, maybe, maybe someone can pull this off, but you know, I think it's risky to think that someone is going to fund you billions of dollars worth of money over time to develop develop this this technology. I mean, certainly there are people that have had that that luck, but 
I, I wouldn't count on it. And people want to see progress along the way. So that's when that's why we at Exosonic want to develop this stepping stone approach with a smaller supersonic product that we can not only sell, but show to investors, customers, suppliers, etc., that we can pull off a supersonic vehicle and in fact then generate revenue from that. And that'll only help our business case when we get to the supersonic airliner where there's a lot more at play in that risk. Definitely. Yeah. You have uh, midpoints in between to the end goal that make it easier to validate uh, mm -hmm. the potential of what you're doing and also to build mm -hmm. credibility in your ability to uh, engineer something that will actually work. For sure. Like, I think if I may add on to that, you know, we hear a lot about venture capital and what they're looking for. And may maybe I'll be a skewer for this on Twitter or social media. Uh, but I'll be honest, right, from our experiences, I mean, a lot of people talk about a visionary team, great, great product, great market fit, you know, founder market fit, all these things. But at the end of the day, the job of a VC or an investor in general is to make money for their investors, right? And so, you know, you can have this audacious dream, you can have a great company, and I think the challenge here with deep tech companies or hardware companies is, is that you are put in comparison with many other types of companies like enterprise SaaS. And objectively, if you compare between the two, which one is more likely to provide you a return? Right? I would say enterprise SaaS. Right? That's why there's so many VCs going into that territory. So uh, that's why it's also important when you talk to VCs is you need to find someone that is okay with investing in the, in the technologies that you're looking at, right? Because they're already, you know, kind of self-selecting into that. It's like, I understand that enterprise SaaS makes a lot of money, but I want to make a difference in the world in this way. And, and in my way, it, that's hardware. And then from there, there's another subset. So you always have to think of your company in a competition of other companies within or without your category. And is it is it difficult to find investors that think in that way? Like, are most investors SaaS focused, or has it not been that big of a challenge? Um, I think recently, with all the space, EV, tall, you know, aviation companies, and and honestly, you know, with SpaceX's success, right? There's been a lot more capital flowing in into the space and hopefully aerospace industry as a whole now. I mean. We're seeing these mega rounds where it's like tens of millions of dollars for a series, you know, series A, hundreds of millions of dollars later on. And even this new phenomena of SPACs, where these companies that are these space companies that are pre-revenue being acquired by these shell companies that list them on the stock market. Right. Virgin Galactic being one of one of them. And there's many more that are uh, that have spac and are now on the stock exchange. So mm -hmm. there, there's a lot more appetite for sure, but it, it is, it is challenging. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I don't imagine that's easy, but, uh, in terms of the challenges, what other, what other major challenges do you face in being able to bring something as bold as a supersonic plane into the market? <laughs> what are, what are the, the barriers are that you constantly face and what are you doing to overcome them? Yeah. I mean, I think finding, um, product market fit is certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge um, and it's not insurmountable, right? I think in our case, we work a lot with the U.S. government and just the way that they have product market fit and, and ultimately pay for the, the solution is very different from, say, a commercial model, right? Where commercial companies can say, you know, I want this now or, you know, let's pay for it now or like, I see the value of this. Let's like write you a letter of interest. Right. The, the U.S. Air Force, for example, and the DOD in general just cannot do that for legal, regulatory, you know, acquisition law reasons. Um, so there's these opportunities where you can still get traction with the Air Force through small business uh, opportunities like grants, contracts, whatever you want to call them. And, and that's what we've been doing. Now, the challenge then is like, OK, how do we grow these small tens of thousand dollar checks, hundred thousand plus dollar checks? into the multi-million, 10 plus million dollar contracts or even 100 plus million dollar contracts that you see in the news from the large defense primes. And, and that's something that we're working on right now. Um, and I think 
there's certainly a roadmap that the Air Force has made accessible, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's it's easy. Yeah, well, that's 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 good that at least that opportunity with the Air Force exists, and it kind of gives you a roadmap that you could follow with your own company. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I I imagine it's not easy. And you know, one of the things I noticed in doing research is that you had mentioned that to build this exosonic plane, it would take like eight more years from where you are today. And you started the company like two years ago, which mm -hmm. means that when you started, you probably knew this would take around. 10 years to to get to this <laughs> this dream and product that you envisioned for so long so i mean yeah. how does that make you feel how do you feel about the fact that you have to work so hard and wait so long in order to see finally see that end product that you always dreamed about yeah uh so i'll answer this question in two ways uh the first way is that i've, I've already thought about this for 10 plus years it's been a lifelong dream to work on this company and when you talk about dream jobs, this is literally my dream job. I mean, it, it, there are difficult days, don't get me wrong. And sometimes it really sucks. But like when I look back, when I step back from it all and think about like satisfaction, like I cannot be more satisfied than this. Uh, and because I thought about it for so long, I don't mind another 10 years. You know, my dream is that like I can retire from this company after I'm like, 60 70 80 or whatever and that would be awesome now the other thing i want to say which is the second way i'll answer this question is um it's it's a marathon and not a sprint so i think that's important to like make sure that you don't burn yourself out especially in early days because there is a long timeline for this and you need to be, be very intentional about your time and work efficiently instead of just a ton of hours I think there's some differences between enterprise SaaS companies versus, you know, hardware companies because enterprise SaaS just moves at a different pace and you have customers talking to you all day. Maybe for that you do, but I think in the hardware business, it's, it's really about efficiency. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, what, what matters there is the endurance in the marathon. And I mean, one of the best pieces of advice I've received as an entrepreneur is is basically that if you're not willing to dedicate yourself to solving uh to dedicating 10 years of your life to solving a problem then you shouldn't even try because in the midst of the uh challenges and difficulties that will come along the way you'll likely give up too early if it doesn't matter that much to you so that's mm -hmm. that's good that you're you're living your dream even though the dream involves crazy problems uh <laughs> and difficult days but uh but i think when when you do something you love so much, those problems become more of a point of curiosity and, and, and finding a way around it instead of something that just bogs you down and kills you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to, I want to transition now and, and get a little bit more of a sense of your mindset. Okay. So I want to start by asking like, you know, before you're a first time founder. So the, before you started your company and made this initial leap into entrepreneurship, what were some of the fears, doubts, or limiting beliefs that passed through your mind and how did you overcome them and reframe them? And are these things you still think about? Do you still experience them? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a number, you know, some doubts, right? It's like, can you, can you close the aircraft design, right? First and foremost. And, and that's, it's, a, it's a very tough and challenging problem. And uh, I think what you have to do is continually work on that. And that's what we've been doing as a company, right? I mean, the aircraft design or any engineering design is never completely closed until you actually build the airplane or, or the product and manufacture and get it down the assembly line. Even then, I mean, there's some modifications that you do, right? And there's always con con continual improvements. But I think that's one thing that you know we, we constantly think about is in the back of our heads and we're putting our best effort in hiring a bunch of great people to solve that problem. Um, I think in regards to that too, that's why it's also important to develop smaller products because it can, you can get a proof point early on to show, hey, look, yeah, we can develop a, a supersonic airplane and, and here it is and here it is flying as well. So that that is certainly one doubt uh, that, that we think about. <clears throat> yeah, no, I think it's smart to put the doubt in the front of your mind and think strategically on how you can overcome that. 
-hmm. So interesting. Yeah. And what would you say is one of the most valuable mindsets that's helped you get through some of the most insurmountable challenges that you've uh, faced with the work that you're doing? Yeah, I, I think uh, as cliche as it is, um, <clears throat> giving it your all is a really important mindset because I think, you know, committing yourself 100% to the solution it, or the to the problem is really important because it'll allow you to be really creative in how you're looking for ways to address the problem, right? And <clears throat> one example that I have is like, you know, one week, I remember this one week in which I just felt kind of kind of hopeless about, you know, some of our, our shorter term products. And if we can actually find a customer for it, we've been trying many different ideas and none of them seem, seem to really stick. Um, but then, you know, a stroke of inspiration just, you know, kind of popped into my head where I was like, oh, wait, I think this could be a very useful application. And I started doing some Google searching about it and read a little bit more about it. And then pretty soon I was like, okay, I think there's something here. And I just like emailed slash LinkedIn message a number of people and, and texted a few friends about it to see if I can start talking to some potential customers. Um, and, and I think because I had the mindset of like giving it a hundred percent and trying my best to figure out a solution, um, I was able to kind of go outside that, that box and think pretty creatively about a solution. And then that's, that's going to be our new uh, business area in the short term. Hmm. Oh, it's a great example. I think it's very <laughs> easy to get overwhelmed when you're not sure what the direction to go in. But if mm -hmm. you realize that that uncertainty is an opportunity for you to think creatively on how you can overcome that uncertainty, then mm -hmm. rather than bogging you down, it can become an opportunity to develop something, some new approach that could help break you out of that, um, mm -hmm. that out of that place of being stuck. So love that. Yeah. And I mean, out of curiosity, what, a, what does success mean to you? Like, how would you define that for yourself? I think it's when you and I can take a supersonic airplane to New York. <laughs> that's, that's what success would look like. Um, and then on a personal note, I mean, I think unfortunately, you know, it'll take perhaps too long for my, my grandparents to sit on, on our airplane. Uh, but that would be if 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 he, they're still alive at that point in time, that would be another version of success where they can come over the United States and you know in comfort, and where we can go over visit them more frequently because of of the time savings. <laughs> That's beautiful. Really hope you get that opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. But when uh, when we do fly to New York in supersonic planes, we'll definitely have to pop champagne bottles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. Um, cool. And, and on the opposite spectrum, what does failure mean to you? I mean, like, how do you think about it? The potential of failing, given that you're doing something that's so, so incredibly bold and risky. Yeah. I think failure is. <clears throat> it's, you know, in a sense, a learning opportunity. But, you know, if if our company, if Exosonic were to fail, you know, I feel like it can certainly rest without any regret. Like I had my shot on goal and I took that shot and hey, it didn't work for whatever reason, but I certainly grew a lot and I learned a lot of valuable skills and, you know, we built up a fantastic team and I hope they've benefited and rewarded a lot from this experience. Um, so I would look towards that in terms of, you know, if, if this were to go well. I think the journey has been invaluable and I would never undo that because I failed. And that's how I would really look at failure. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. And in that case, really like the major failure, the biggest failure would be to not have taken that risk at all and to have just been uh, saturated by regret, which would have been probably an even worse uh, form of failure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so let's go into some entrepreneurial lessons. I'm curious what, what some things you've learned as an entrepreneur. Sure. So for, for hiring, for basically what you're doing, which requires a very high level of technical skill, like these are not easy engineering problems. 
how have you gone about finding and hiring good talent? And and on top of that, like, you know, this is something super risky. It might not work. Like, how do you convince people that this is something actually worth working on, uh, especially when it can take so many years to actually see it out? Yeah, yeah, those are, those are really great questions. Um, I think a, a really important part of that, of hiring good people was actually just doing a lot of the foundational work of like meeting good people, right? So I, I, I always knew for, for myself that engineering was going to be a means to an end. You know, I wanted to be a competent engineer. And so that's why I wanted to perform well in my undergraduate classes and also in work. And, and that's really helpful because you get to meet, you know, other people that were really great at their, at their work and you can talk to them at that level. And so when I was going through my industry uh, jobs at Northrop Virgin, you know, and, and Lockheed Martin, uh, I got to meet a lot of these people and they were happy to introduce me or mentor me. Um, they introduced me to other, you know, really talented people that were, you know, certainly uh, much more experienced than I was. Uh, and having their mentorship helped me understand both not only the engineering challenges, but also some of the programmatics uh, challenges of developing an aircraft company. Uh, so it was really through the network that I was able to meet some of our earliest, uh, most competent engineering members. Uh, for example, we have a chief engineer, Bob Sandusky, and uh, he is, you know he's designed, basically brought from first line of piece of paper to flight test two supersonic fighters for, for the Air Force. Uh, and he's someone that I met in 2017. He didn't start working with us until 2019. And what we did there was that, you know, I, <laughs> I talked to him about what we're doing. He wanted to see that if I was serious and he gave me some homework, right? Like read a book, write a book report about that. You know, something you do in middle school. And, and I did that because I wanted to, I want to show that I was willing to put in the work. When I went to business school, I kept in touch with him and my co-founder, Tim, at the time, too. He's still with us. Uh, also kept him updated on what we're doing. And we built up this rapport, right? And we showed that we were coachable, willing to listen and learn, but also make progress on our own in our own right. Talking to airlines, talking to engine manufacturers, working with the Air Force. And all of those things started coming together. When we had traction plus the rapport, then that's when he decided, let me give, give these these kids a shot. And now we've been working together for over a year. Wow. Yeah. So it really sounds it's like it's the combination of being a prolific networker and also working hard enough to show that you're serious and that you can actually, uh, you're actually going to do what it takes to make this happen. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And yeah. And what would you say, like, uh, what, what's what been your approach to networking? Like, how do you think about it? How do you approach it? How have you been able to meet all of these people? Um, certainly business school helped. I met a lot of people mm -hmm. and also, of course, working in industry, that's helped. Um, aerospace, probably like many other industries, it's, it's a pretty small world. Uh, for example, one of my, the person that hired me as an intern at a college, uh, became the, you know, a chief exec, you know, a, a chief officer of one of our competitors. Uh, and then, you know, that competition, unfortunately, went bankrupt. And now we're, we're talking again, and I can learn a lot from him. So it's just maintaining those relationships. Uh, and the way that I did that was, of course, being engaged uh, in terms of professional aspects. I also wrote thank you cards to a number of uh, people. Uh, when I was switching jobs, I would always write thank you cards to those people that uh, made an impact in my life. Um, and, you know, others I said, but it doesn't matter. But um, that, and I think just being curious about their experiences, right? Showing that you like authentically actually want to know about what their lives were like and what their lessons were. I think that's really valuable. Like we need to remember that everyone's a human being and has a human story behind the title, the responsibilities that they have and, and trying to, you know, grab that out, right. Try to recognize the humanity in everyone is also important as you, as you network. Hmm. Yeah. I love the idea of sending thank you cards because I think gratitude is one of the most powerful ways to build a deeper relationship. And when you're grateful for other people, 
people want to help you more because they realize that you're not just taking that help for granted. You're actually making the most out of it. And that gratitude is almost like inspires reciprocity to the person that you're giving the gratitude to for them to want to give you more. So that's, that's powerful. And with thank you cards, like who receives thank you cards nowadays? Uh, not many people do. So when, so when someone does receive it, it's like, wow, that's, that's a special touch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. Cool. Good, good power tip. Uh, <laughs> awesome. So, so let's see, Nora. So if you could teach young entre- entrepreneurs, one concept, whether it's related to life or entrepreneurship, what concept would you teach them? I, th- I, I want to state how important hard work and grit is, especially when going down the entrepreneurial journey. I think smarts will certainly help you along the way, but at the end of the day, there's nothing that can replace hard work uh, and, and efficient work. You don't want to just put a bunch of hours that don't go anywhere, right? So it's hard, efficient work that really matters. And I think with that too, is the willingness to learn anything, especially when you're in a founder's role. There's a lot of things that you're <laughs> you're going to do that you would be surprised that you have to do or never thought about doing as part of a, a founder's responsibilities. Um, but being open to those opportunities and really appreciating that <laughs> as you know something that that is worth learning uh, and embracing that. I think those are. Hard work and the willingness to learn uh, esoteric things is all really important. Yeah, that's that's super important. I I recently listened to um, one of Naval Ravikant's podcasts, which I highly recommend. And he had this segment where he talked about that three of the most important things for uh, succeeding in your startup is one, make sure you're working on the right thing. Two, make sure you're working with the right people. And three to work really hard. And all of these three things are all super important. Uh, And they're each like kind of uh, legs on a stool because the stool wouldn't be able to hold itself without any of these legs. And one example Mm -hmm. is that you can have an amazing team and work really hard, but if you're not working on the right thing, you might fail or it might not have that high of an impact. And it's the same Mm -hmm. thing for these other things. So I love that you emphasize the importance of hard work and when you pair that together with doing something important with a great team, such as you're doing as well, I, I think that's where when you have the power trio that helps you succeed and and uh, go on a rocket that goes I don't know where, <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. somewhere high. But um, but cool. So last two questions for you, Norris. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm curious. You know, you you're an avid learner. Uh, so what uh, entrepreneurship related books or resources have impacted you the most or would you recommend the most uh, to other young entrepreneurs? Oh, geez. <laughs> Recently, I've avoided uh, those types of books, uh, mostly because I've been reading a lot of science fiction so I can like kind of mm. relax a bit. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, but I would say... Um, I forget the one. Uh, let me let me just Google this real. I think there's the hard things about hard things. Ah, uh, yeah, by Ben Horowitz. Yeah, that one. That was that was. Uh, I I gotta say that was that was a really honest take on developing a company, and I and I really liked it. Um, I I thought I learned a lot about, like, kind of the culture that you set. You know, certainly about survival. Uh, that was really a lot of crazy things happened with with their companies. Um, the other book I would recommend um, is Shoe Dog, which is about the the founding of Nike. And I really thought that uh, Phil Knight was just it was just like an honest take about how he developed the company. And it's just so funny to hear some of the the very you know kind of simple things or crazy things or just random things that happened. Like, for example, how the logo was formed, right? It was a very like, oh, that's the logo. Well, we got to put it on a shoe and start selling it. So like, I guess that's it. And now it's this like iconic image, right? Um, and <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of the other moments in, in that book that just shows like how 
coincidental or I don't know how to say it, but just how sometimes not thought out things are with a company when you think that everything just was perfect. That's certainly not true. Wow. That's a powerful lesson. Yeah. From, from, from our perspective, it's easy to see these products and think that there was so much like calculated, thoughtful design and strategic decision-making that led to these brilliant decisions. But, uh, many cases it wasn't that sophisticated or structured and, uh, it just happened and it worked. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Right. Exactly. That's funny. I love that. Um, cool. Yeah. So as, as a final question, Norris, I'm curious what, what impact do you want to have in the invention of the future? Like, how do you, how do you think you will invent the future? You know, if we can get around the world instantaneously, that's what we would do. And we want to make progress towards that. So that distance is no longer a barrier to close relationships. Yeah. And I think COVID has taught us the importance of that more than ever. And when distance is no longer a problem, we're able to um, express more of our humanity with each other. So Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Cool, man. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time. This was super fun. And I'm uh, I'm excited to board a rocket ship with you someday. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Thanks, Julian, for the time. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to to your your members. Absolutely. Yeah, and as a as a final question, where where can people learn more about you and Exosonic and and everything else? Yeah, uh, we're on social media, uh, so there's obviously exosonic.com, and then we have uh, a lot of the handles or uh, URLs of you know Fly Exosonic, so facebookcom Exosonic or LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, so you can find us on social media, and feel free to reach out. We have a contact us page on our website too. Great. Cool. We'll include that in the show notes, but, uh, mm-hmm. but awesome. Thanks again, Norris. Uh, wish you all your best on your crazy journey and adventures and, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for listening and we'll go ahead and catch you on the ne- next episode. Take care and be infinite, my friends.